Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you. And, uh, I'm really honored and privileged that you've come to my session. And uh, it's not going to be a rock show, but I'd like to start with a song that I wrote uh, at the request of uh, my editor at HarperCollins. Who asked me when I was finishing the book, he asked me to write a song about writing the book. And although I liked the idea very much, I told him that I could not write a song on request. You know, because I could write a song on request about other about other situations. It's a film song where the hero and the heroine are doing something in particular or or something like that, but a song which is supposed to, to reflect my own feelings, I did not do it at somebody else's request. But somehow, on the very day that I sent the final manuscript, the song came, it came out. It just, this thing just came out. We never, we never planned it out. And I'm going to sing just the first verse of the song. It's called uh, it, A Life in Words. Comeback edition of the Goa Arts and Literature Festival with that. Thank you so much. Another big hand, please, for the Friends, when 
Ibrahim also and I and the International Center worked to put together this festival 13 years ago. Um, Remo was kind enough to end the, to bless us uh, in the first edition and ended the first evening. And I'm really grateful that he's back here um, to help us end the comeback edition. is very meaningful. Um, and I'm so grateful that we have so many wonderful writers here as well as all of you. And that is the avatar which Remo performed last time. It was at a, as a musician who was talking about his cultural history. Today we're talking about a literary life because he has released really one of the best cultural histories and autobiographies, memoirs of recent years. A big hand for Remo, the author. The privilege and the honor is all mine to be here. I never expected to ever be in a literary festival. And here I am among brilliant minds, totally intimidated and uh, humbled. So here I am. Rema, how did the book happen? When did, uh, you've always been the writer of fantastic lyrics. Uh, I, I recall, sorry. Um, you have a tremendous visual sense. We've seen you as an artist before. This is a weighty and important volume because it recalls an era, a time, a generation, a way of being uh, in transition. A very important book for people like myself who look back at Goan cultural history also. Where did this idea come and to begin with, how, where did the idea come and how did you go about doing it? Well, I'm a great lover of, uh, of autobiographies to start with. And I always thought that uh, if I ever wrote my own story, I would uh, I would try to have the honesty that Elia Kazan had in his, you know, he was merciless with himself in his honesty. And I tried, I tried to be honest, as honest as I could, without hurting the feelings of others. Because when you're writing your own story, you know, you might want to be very honest, but uh, you've also got to consider other people's privacy. And I had decided that my story wasn't just going to be my story, like me, I, myself. The story of uh, Goa to start with, the Goa that I grew up in, the story of uh, the Bombay that I lived in. When I was studying architecture there in the 70s, uh, my experiences in Europe and in North Africa when I was hitchhiking there in the 80s, uh, no, in the late in the late 70s, and a little bit of my own you know, professional career. But uh, I did not really want to make that, you know, uh, the main point of the book, you know, it's not a, a book written by a pop uh, a rock singer glorifying himself and all the hits that he has done. No, in fact, uh, I hardly wrote about, about those. And again, it was Udayan Mishra who, said, who told me, listen, Remo, you've got to write more about the songs, especially the film songs, because India is a film-centric country. And I'm sure they would like to know some anecdotes behind Hama Hama, behind Pyar Tohunai Tha, and of course, my own, uh, you know, my own English songs, which uh, only a small percentage knows, because it's a small, you know, you can do that's uh, the percentage that listens to non-film and non-Hindi music in India. Um, so the idea to write this, like I, like I told, I've always loved writing, and not only lyrics. I've enjoyed writing for myself, you know. I'm in prose. I wrote columns for newspapers, for magazines, because I always loved writing. And, uh, but there's a huge, there was a huge difference, writing a column here and a column there, and, and a book like this, because I've never written, and I have never written a book since. So I didn't know how many words it was gonna be. And uh, when my agent, Imari Sodhi, told me that uh, normally autobiographies in India are about 90,000 words. At the most, they might go up to 100. And when I wrote 120 or 130, I was worried that they were going to slash it. Udayan Mitra read it, and then his thing said, but Remo, you didn't write about this. But Remo, you didn't write about that, and this and that. And he made it grow into 150,000. So it's all his fault. <laughs> if it's that big, it's his fault, not mine. But. Uh, yeah, I really, really, really enjoyed writing it. And I think uh, writing about one's own life is something I would I would suggest. And 
and I would uh, <clears throat> urge everybody to do, whether you're famous, whether you're a writer, whether you're not, you know, just for yourself. It helps to place you like nothing else can. So it's more than a therapy session. It's like helps you to know where you've come from, how much you've traversed in life, where you are right now. Maybe it'll, it'll help you to see where you want to go from now. It, it's a fantastic exercise. I loved it. Super interesting, and I, it's lovely to hear that in an audience full of writers. So tell me, in the writing of this, uh, writer to writer, were there any surprises in Remo's own life when you were writing? Did the patterns, new ways of seeing things, a kind of a narrative emerge that was even fresh to you? Absolutely. And uh, you mentioning that there are writers here, you just gave me a whole list and a whole background on all the illustrious writers here. I'm nervous about this. And, and like I said, I never ever thought that I would ever be anywhere in the literary festival with a book out. And I was, and the first time that I went to a literary festival, I was pretty, you know, I won't say nervous or shy, but asking myself, do I really, really belong in this world? And then I consoled myself by telling myself, well, if I ask all these fantastic writers to sing a song, maybe I'll sing it better. <laughs> <laughs> that was a consolation. And, uh, uh, and I'm feeling a little bit at ease now. And uh, yes, it was a fantastic uh, discovery of myself, you know, writing this. And uh, a discovery of how much I remembered. And I couldn't believe that I remembered all those things you know, that I wrote about. Like I said in the song, they're like little birds and you never know, you, you know where they'll fly once you start writing. You never know where they'll fly and where, which memory they'll, they'll pick up on, which you know, can of worms they'll open. And I try to write about them all, the songs by the birds as well as the worms that they pick up. And I hope I've been honest. I have been as honest as I could. I hope I've been honest enough writing the book. A lot of people have told me that I have. I think, uh, well, uh, one of the things about the book that's really marvelous, it's interesting you mentioned that because for me, of course, I was super interested in your life and I've been a fan uh, for many years in a multi-dimensional way, so I was interested in the book. But the, it immediately yielded value for me as a writer who looks at this culture because it's a meticulous cultural archive, actually. And what Ramo said about how much you could remember, it's quite astounding because I actually live maybe 50 meters away from my ancestral home here, opposite the Marriott kind of, right behind Solmar. And so the geography is very familiar to me, but the way you, uh, you reconstruct the atmosphere, he's also got photographs. It's very meticulous. The individuals that he mentions, it's like a family tree of uh, Panjim, actually. You know, this, uh, and the cultural history and the way it emerged. So it's a really uh, terrific book for for that reason. And I, I must compliment you for that for that part of it. Um, and of course, it it also depicts the world. So over the course of the last two or three days, we have a number of our finest writers from around India here. Over the last two or three days, they have been. Ex being exposed to a little bit, of course, we want to know about the worlds that they have brought into life, but we are also trying to talk to them about Goa. Uh, Mr. Mauzo, um, General Cardo spoke to them about the Goa he knew from 80 years ago. Um, this book has a lot about the Panjim, which they are experiencing now in kind of hipster 2023 Instagram era Panjim. What was Panjim like when you were growing up here um, in your childhood, or would you like? Uh, can you, can you tell them, Mark? Help me, help us explain. I'll, I'll tell them. Read my book. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. Buy it first. True. But does it feel like, does it feel like, I mean, if you had to just help me describe to these authors the, the, the sleepy, pleasant, intimate city that you grew up in? in, uh, in uh, I don't know. How do you describe perfection? Perfection. How do you describe perfection? And especially when you're a kid, everything is perfect. Especially when you're a kid who's been lucky enough to have a perfect life, you know. Uh, there are so many artists who, whose childhoods are troubled, and traumatized, and uh, being molested by family members, and horrible things. But I was just 
I'm just one of those that uh, grew up in a fairy tale, in a fairy tale childhood, in a fairy tale family, in a fairy tale uh, neighborhood, which I've described. There was I used to run in and out of people's home, all my all my neighbors' homes. The oldest one was eight years old. He used to collect stamps. He used to allow me to sit on his uh, on his chair on his lap and go through all his stamps. Uh, but I was not allowed to touch anything. He could only look. Once in a while, he would let me look through this magic thing called a magnifying glass. Yeah, a magnifying glass. It was, it, it was magic for a, for a kid of six and seven years old. Mm -hmm. Then I wanted to be a philatelist myself. And uh, uh, my father bought me a little set of an album and a, and a few stamps, foreign stamps. And, but, you know, philately is, is too, too passive a profession for a six-year-old. So after a while, I was back to football and Cordobal and marbles and stuff. The neighborhood on, on the other side, all this is across the street, OK? And, and crossing the street, you were allowed to do alone because the, the crossing the street was <coughs> almost as safe as taking a walk in your own compound. Uh, you know, traffic was one car every five minutes in, in the middle of Panjim. Uh, on the other side, there was a large large Damanes. important one, all the, all the higher educational institutions were here. So if anybody wanted to do a higher course from the one from Diu, they had to come to Goa. And they were staying over there, and on evenings, on evenings when they were very homesick, they would sit in the veranda and sing songs from the one, and there were such beauties, such beauties. And that's why I heard Maria Pitashi for the first time. I recorded it, I recorded my own version of that song a few years ago. And it, it became a huge hit all over India, and especially with Goans, of course, and uh, showing that uh, you know music and language knows no barrier, especially when this language knows no barrier when it's in a song, and uh, because it's in the Portuguese, which even the Portuguese cannot understand. <laughs> really, the Daman Portuguese is a dialect in its own. That the Portuguese can, I have to translate the song into Barra da Daman Miluzi, Estreita e Comprida. Estreita e Comprida, nobody. Estreita e Comprida. Alegre na entrada, Miluzi, triste na saída. Alegre na entrada e triste na saída. Only when I say it this way can a Portuguese person understand it. But this is the, the Portuguese from Daman. You know, and the. On the, on the right hand side, there was a Gujarati family <coughs> saying, and they had, they had two sons of my age. I mean, one was one year younger, one was one year older, so at that time, it was the same age. And they were my best friends growing up. Uh, Raju and Chandu, Raju and Chandu. And uh, I've written about all of the things here, and how I could just run in and out of all these houses, all this, so, and uh, a couple of houses after me, there were, there were the Sardasais, who were the eldest brother, the eldest son who was, it was a professor at the Lyceum, at the at Honorable Lyceum in, uh, in Panjim. And the youngest, youngest son became one of the best known architects in Pedro Sardasai. And their sisters used to tease me, they used to say, She to Kiristan to Mas Hata. <laughs> See, you are a Christian and you eat meat. And I should say, she, you are a Hindu and your dog is a, uh, and your god is an elephant. And, and it just symbolizes the, the communal harmony that there was in Goa, you know. We used to laugh about these things, tease each other. Today, if somebody had to say things other, we would start a riot probably, depending who one said it to. It's so sad. But anyway, like I said, I was a six-year-old who would run in and out of the houses of, of people of different ages, and I thought of all of them as my friends. I used to go to this eight-year-old stamp collector with my doodle or a snakes and ladders board under my hand. So you're Avarish, can bring car? Mr. Avarish, you want to play? 
as if he was my, my contemporary. And he would sit and play snakes and ladders and rule with me for hours. I'm sorry, I'm going on. <laughs> Glorious uh, old world atmosphere yes, that, that you that you describe, and then how did you go from there to become India's pioneering rock and roll guy? How did that happen? What is the moment? Is it music that did it to you? Is it the times? Is it the hippies that were coming into Goa? Is it a combination? I know it's in the book, but how would you describe it? I, you know, there was no no particular moment when I decided I was going to be a musician. When, I, when, uh, when music hit me. I first went on stage when I was five. So I always thought of myself as this little boy who played and sang. That's it. It was as natural as breathing. You know, just as we all, all of us write. We write letters. We write emails, you know, today. But it doesn't mean that we think of ourselves as authors. I mean, those who are not authors, and, you know, we still write. Uh, so in the same way, so many kids in Goa all sang, at least sang, if not played the guitar. So many kids played the guitar and other instruments. And uh, I always thought of myself as a kid who, who played. It was normal. And I went up on stage when I was five, as I said. Uh, you know, my father took me to a recital, a concert at the club, at the social club in Paris, the Club National. And, uh, that's it, and I loved it. I just, I, I took to the stage like a, to use a very common expression, like a fish takes to water. Because before that, I used to make my, my parents sit in the living room, and I would part the curtains and appear there as if that was a stage, <laughs> and, and they had to clap, of course. And then I would bow, <laughs> and I would sing a song, and they would clap again, and I would bow again, and part the curtains and walk off. So that, you know, yeah, so the thing of being on stage was always there in me, and. So it never came to, that's the time when I decided to be a musician. No, there came a time when, that was the time when I decided to be an architect. Don't ask me why. That was <laughs> the biggest mistake in my life. But uh, yeah, I was told that music was a great uh, pastime, but that it wasn't a secure enough profession. And sure enough, it wasn't. At that time in Goa, there was no future in music. So I had to have, a, a proper profession. Medicine and all those other things didn't interest me, but a cousin came down from, from London and the whole family made a big fuss of him. He's an architect, he's an architect. I said, what is that? No, he's an architect. I said, what does an architect do? He designs, designs houses. Oh, design? That's right, up my alley, because I love drawing also. Besides music, I loved drawing. I still do. And uh, a lot of my drawings in the book, by the book, so a lot of my and, uh, uh, half of Parliament would be so proud of me if they were here today. <laughs> and uh, they've done right by you, and you're doing very right by them. There's no doubt. It's the book's doing very well. By the way, Professor Mustansi Daldi of JJ School of Architect College of Architecture is here. He's a dear friend of the festival and a terrific poet. So here's what happens to the best of architects, uh, must not say, because that's his alma mater. Um, I hope you don't know anything about my attendance records. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, I don't think you were there at my time. You were, you were too young to have been there. Little okay. later. But what about rock and roll? So this music I understand, but very few. How did this epiphany, epiphany come that some that you decided to make it an art form and that you expressed yourself via via your original music. The history of Indian rock and roll, by the way, uh, Remo is intrinsic to the history of Indian rock and roll from the very beginning. Um, uh, the the strain, the the savages from the savages, and then of course the for India's first hit rock pop songs were all by Remo, and of course the singer songwriter um, uh, he he sang to Rajiv Gandhi, uh, had the temerity to sing to Rajiv Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi responded and this was, and then you became the first uh, Indian musician to be a cultural export in this medium. All of this is quite a remarkable kind of a new thing for India. How did the light bulb go on for you that this became the style of music? I would like to correct you a little bit on that, Please. not out of humility, but out of, out of respect for these artists. When I was in school, in Goa, 
there was a band from Calcutta who released a 45 in a record called Love is a Mango. I don't know how many of you are old enough to have known that song. It was a beautiful song and they used the sitar. Love is a Mango. Love is a Mango. Love is a mango that grows on a tree. Wait till the mango is right. That was a tune that rings a bell But but that was, you know, that was the first original song, a pop song that I heard by an Indian group. Okay. And I was still in school, so they were a few years older to me. And uh, the other record that I heard, of course, that was not an original song. It was the Savages again, right. who recorded a foreign hit called Simple Simon Says. So when I was eventually asked to join the Savages, for me, they were these recording artists. The recording contract at that time was like, a, if you were a recording artist, you were like sitting next to God, at, at God's right hand up there in heaven. You know? and they asked me to join their band, I couldn't believe it. But yeah, Love is a Mango is the first original pop song, Indian pop song that I heard. And not many people realize this or see it that way, but the first pop fusion music that I heard was by a Parsi gentleman called Meena Kaba, who wrote these amazing hits called Bombay Mary. Everybody knows it today, but nobody, nobody thinks of it as Indo-Western fusion. It played a very serious role, way, way ahead of its time, with that Maharashtrian kind of beat and English lyrics. I married a female wrestler, that was another hit of his. And uh, makes sense. So these, actually, these guys are the forerunners actually to what I did. But yeah, I was I was there soon after that. And, uh, what are the records that you heard that made your life but that made the that maybe helped you understand that rock was going to be your thing? Rock happened to me again the same cousin of mine is to blame, the guy who influenced me into architecture. He came down from England. At least the second time he was right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the second time he was right. He and another female cousin of ours, they, they both came down from London on holidays, and they brought a record by Bill Haley and the Comets called Rock Around the Clock. And, and they demonstrated this new dance to us in their living room. And I couldn't believe this dance. They, the couple hardly touched each other. All we have seen under them were waltzes and foxtrots and rambas and sambas and, and, and of course tangos. Here they flung each other in the air, they pushed each other to the other corner of the of, of the room and they lifted each other down. What was happening here? And that music, that rock music, one rock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, so exciting. That excitement was something else. Until then I'd grown up on Portuguese music, on Latin music. Beautiful, the most beautiful music, one of the most beautiful musics in the world, I would say. But rock and roll was something else. Just two chords, three chords were enough. That excitement, and uh, I must have been what, 10, 11. So at that age, that impression is to me. And then, of course, like you rightly said, the hippie era, when music took a turn for the series, for amazing, amazing music. The kids today, say that the best music they hear is from the record from, from the record co collection of their parents, music from the Woodstock era. The most meaningful music for a long time, because after that, music in the West became so commercial and pro-established. They, they didn't even talk about establishment after that. But in the 70s, it was so anti-establishment, anti-war, anti-this, anti-that, it was so meaningful. And, uh, and at a punk festival like Woodstock, there were all genres of music happening, all, all genres of artists, and the same one audience enjoying it all. There was a difference between, you know, between the audience of those days and the audience of today. Today, an audience goes to a trans party, all they want to hear is all night long, maybe for three nights. And you play a folk song there, they'll boo the artist out. That's how you know, compartmentalized we have become. In music, in food, in books, in everything. It's, you, you either like this or you like that. But that one same audience sitting from John Baez to 10 years after to the heaviest rock to the sweetest folk singing, 
and everything in between. Those were the years. I was so lucky to have grown up in those years. And that movie or something else, because there was no television in India. So although we had heard records by these fantastic international artists, we had never seen them on stage. When I saw them, what they did on stage, I couldn't believe it. The energy, the movement. Uh, I, 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 went to, I went and I saw that film every day that it ran at Eros. Uh, my bunking classes at JJ's, that's why I was hoping that <laughs> The professor in chases didn't know about my attendance record. But that was not the only time that I bunked classes. Uh, I also sat in my hostel room with my guitar and uh, wrote songs and devised a way to, to tune the guitar, to make it sound like a sitar. Because again, it was Woodstock which inspired me to find my Indian roots. Because in Woodstock, Joe Cocker had done an amazing version of With a Little Help from My Friends. And I hate it when somebody touches a Beatles song because, again, how dare you touch perfection, you know? But Joe Cocker's version was the only one which I liked as much as the Beatles, totally different from the Beatles version. Little, little Help From My Friends was a masterpiece. And I went home and I decided, I'm an Indian and I want to do an Indian version of it, Little Help From My Friends. So I worked out a way to, to tune my guitar so it sounded a bit like a sarod or a sitar, and I Indianized my vocals. And so Woodstock inspired me to look into my own roots as well. Again, I'm just going over well, amazing. Uh, you can see why the book is so compelling. Um, I definitely want to take some questions from the audience. They will have a lot of questions for you. But uh, we had discussed perhaps you reading a segment now, so and then we'll take questions directly. Sure. Um, until you decide. Vivek has chosen this uh, this, we this thought passage. To bring you up to date in uh, in Remo's, Remo's uh, life. Yeah. This one is called, this passage is called On Vasco da Gama's Reverse Trail. I was disillusioned with the way Goa was going and I guess I was subconsciously searching for a place where I could find the simple things I had grown up with as a child. Cleanliness, <coughs> respect for nature, discipline, and grace on the roads and in queues and in all spheres of life. A government that worked for the country and for the people. No blatant corruption. And above all, a populace that was respectful, polite, kind, helpful, and honest towards each other. I realize I had used these qualities to describe the Goa I grew up in in the beginning chapters of this book. I was now coming full circle. I traveled through, I had traveled through half the countries in the world thanks to my profession and I could, and I could see clearly that I was rediscovering all of these intangible but, but you know, priceless treasures in Porto together with an unexpected sensation of coming back to my roots. By the time we returned to Goa, I started seriously thinking of, of getting myself an apartment in Porto to spend, say, three or four months a year there. I had never left Goa for better prospects, neither financial nor professional, not even to go to, to Mumbai, the showbiz capital of India, which I'm sure would have yielded me at least 10 times more money and fame. But now that the beauty of Goa I had stayed back for was fast disappearing, not just a natural beauty, beauty being smothered under greedy, ugly concrete, but also the people's honesty, warmth, friendliness, and hospitality. I surprised myself thinking that I could gladly leave it for a few months every year. In Portugal, I had found the Goa that might have been if it had only developed, you know, developed in the right way, with restrictions, protecting Mother Nature, with firmness. Historic monuments and beautiful ancient villages carefully preserved and restored. Perfect roads leading everywhere. Electricity, water, internet, cable TV, and other services that didn't break down even once in years. And not just a, and not just a judiciary that made laws, but also an enforcement that saw to it that everybody, everyone followed them. A place where you could walk into a government office and 
half an hour later, walk out with everything you had come for, without the reddest possibility of someone asking for a bribe or harassing you. Also, I had reached a stage in life which made such a move easy. Both my parents had passed away, so there was no longer an aged mother or father I didn't want to stay away from for months. My sons had both flown the nest. Noah had completed his multimedia course in Singapore and now worked there. And Jonah was studying underwater cinematography in Thailand. And I no longer had a wife who would have insisted on me buying a place in her France instead. No, no more ties binding me down or holding me back. My life shows too have diminished considerably considerably for reasons explained earlier. And I could always fly back for those. I was going to make Vasu da Gama's journey from Portugal to Goa in reverse, and in much greater comfort than in his caravel. The nationality that I was born into is the, is the title of the next passage. Portugal, Portugal had never cancelled Goan's Portuguese nationalities from its records for the simple reason that Goans, unlike, say, the Brazilians or the Angolans, had never revolted against Portuguese occupation or, or fought to drive them out. They dec the Portuguese decreed that the Satyagras who fought for Goa's liberation movement had come mainly from, from Goa's neighboring states. Therefore, Portugal saw and recognized all Goans born in Goa before 1961 as their descendants and, and their descendants as being entitled to Portuguese nationality, and they do so until today. I contacted the same lawyer whose work on my Portuguese nationality I had interrupted back in 1979. Luckily, he still had my papers and said very little was left to turn me into a, a full-fledged Portuguese national. I asked him to please go ahead and complete the procedure for all these years. It was curious how the flag I had drawn as a child in my school drawing books continued to arouse emotion, not as a matter of political affiliation, but as an emotion one feels on eating mother's cooking after decades. Also, seeing the very Portuguese language written all around me, even the simple and common atensão, attention, or perigo, danger, on signboards near railway lines or high voltage electrical installations, thrilled me and brought back childhood memories of Goa. I wasn't opting for the nationality of a strange new country like the US, like the US or Canada or the UK. I was returning to the nationality, language, country, and flag of my childhood, those I had held as my own until the tender age of eight. When I, hitch, when I was a hitchhiker in Europe in the 70s, I had marveled so easily with their European passports without requiring visas for most countries, and how they used a plastic card to walk into an ATM and withdraw their money whenever and wherever they needed it, and how they could own cars and driving licenses there, and even at how they could go to their own homes and apartments at the end of the day. Well, now I would have all those things, and it felt like a long cherished dream coming true. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Let's take some questions from the audience. We're starting with Amit Ranjan, fine poet who's launched his book here at the festival. Also has a wonderful book on John Lang. Hi, Remo. Hi. You are that cousin who came the first time. And I held the guitar and never succeeded with it. Like, you failed with architecture. So I have two questions. I have about 20, the remaining 18 I will send on email. The first Sorry. one is about, um, I have two questions. Yes. The remaining 18 I will send on email. <laughs> the first is, do you remember the New Year song you sang on Guru Darshan when I was four years old? That's the question. If you could sing it at the end. The second question is, um, um, so would you like to share something from your time in Caribbean? I'm really fascinated by uh, Jahaji music, the film I uh, often show it to my students. Anything? Sorry, I didn't understand that. Would I like to share what? Um, 
any funny or frustrating incident from your time in Caribbean from um, in the I Caribbean Jahaji Jaha Jaha music. I show it to my students um, quite often. Um, it's a fascinating film. And also your engagement with them is fascinating, both the funny and the frustrating aspect of it. So if you'd like to share anything funny or frustrating. And finally, a bonus question. How or why uh, do you refuse to age? You could either answer how or the why. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. just told me that I've been answering this, this question with the same answer for the last 15 years. You know, why don't I look my age? Uh, and I told her that is because you've been asking me, you've been asking me the same question for the last 25 years. So, so how can I change my answer every year? By my answer is booze, sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a joke. Okay, now there's much less booze in my life. Uh, the first question, when you were four years old, now I've got to figure out how old you are now to figure out what song I sang when you were four years old. But a New Year song... On Doordarshan. Yeah, on Doordarshan. I, I remember doing one New Year program on Doordarshan. I think I sang a song called Ocean Queen. Ocean, Ocean Queen. Queen. Was it Ocean Queen? In the lyrics there was Happy New Year as well. That's what oh, it was. okay. Then I think it was a composition of mine where I... It, it first came about when I was doing a New Year show and, and I just... Uh, made it up at midnight. And then every year it became a thing, you know. Goodbye, 81. Eight, you've been a whole lot of fun. And then, hello, 82. The beat was ding, 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 ding. And then it was, hello, 82. 82, how do you do? It was a silly rhyme like that. And then, and then the next day it was goodbye 82 uh, something something. We are not 87. Hello 83. I hope you're going to set me free. Whatever you know, whatever came to mind, is just uh, freak out. And, uh, see, it was that kind of song. And uh, for that whole mood and in my band, but okay. That's the second. No, that's a, that was the first question. Caribbean. There was nothing frustrating about the Caribbean except that. Uh, the women were too beautiful, uh, and, and there's nothing very frustrating about that. But uh, funny incidents, yeah, there were lots of funny incidents. And just understanding their English was, was such a you know such a challenge. And listening to their English, the Rasta, the Rasta English, especially, uh, was always amazing to listen to. And and the and the realization the realization that Jamaica okay I'm, I'm going a little away from you know that Jamaica that small little island the the self confidence that those people have in themselves I discovered when I finally smoked a joint in Jamaica <laughs> I was self confident as, as well it's a it's a very different kind of uh, ganja marijuana you know very different the one we get here. And uh, to think that that little island had produced Nobel Prize winners in literature, in, in different fields, a small little island. And, uh, and the music, to realize that they had been ruling world music ever since. I can remember the Calypso onwards. You know, from, from Calypso onwards, the world had been, had been grooving to Jamaican music. Now I had heard rap. Rap was ruling America, therefore the world. And when I went to Jamaica, I heard rap. And I was and I was quite disappointed. And I told them, Oh my God! So finally, America managed to conquer y'all. Huh? And, uh, and now y'all are playing rap. You, you don't have your, your own music anymore, like you did reggae just a few years ago. You were ruling the world with reggae. And they said, You joking, man? I can't do the whole Jamaican trip, but uh, they said rap comes from dance hall. Dance hall was the name of rap music in Jamaica. It came from Jamaica. Now Americans could not, you know, copy reggae and claim it was theirs that they invented it. They could not do that to, to Calypso. But when rap came out, Americans just took it over and, 
and changed the name of the music. So rap music also came from Jamaica. Can you imagine that even today, the small little island is ruling the world in music. And uh, really the self-confidence that they have in themselves is amazing, amazing. Uh, so more than so more than funny or, uh, or frustrating incidents, I think this is what I took away from the Caribbean, from uh, the, I think the music in, uh, in Seychelles and in Reunion Island, and in Mauritius, especially Mauritius, the Sega, they all have the music called Sega, especially the music from, 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 uh, from Mauritius is so very much like the Goan, but except that the accent is on a different beat. The Goan beat is whereas their accent is you know, so the accent is on a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. And somehow after I came back from, from, from the Caribbean, I incorporated that beat when I sing Goan music, including Maria Pitashi, it just came naturally to me. Singing good, Mundra Mucha Mama, because it's all three, four, uh, you know, four twelves or whatever. I, I don't know music theory, okay? But it's, 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 uh, it's that kind of a rhythm, but uh, it is, it's that kind of tempo. But the beat, the way it's played on the drums is different. Than I play it that way. So a lot of influences. I forgot what your third and fourth view. You promised no, no, so you said he emailed you 18 more. more. Can, can he he email you 18 more. 18? 18. 18. 18 more. He will email you 18 more. I have one sentence to say, which is that. No, can we have somebody else? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One chance for somebody else. Two more questions. If, uh, some more questions? Anyone else with a question? Prabhu, what about uh, writing? Are you continuing to write? Are you going to be uh, doing another book? Imali Sodhi, my, my agent, has been insisting that I write another book, but really I can't, uh, I can't think of what to write about, you know, because I'm not a writer, really. And, uh, and I read long ago that you know, one should write about what you know, one knows and, uh, and what I know better than, than my own life story. So that's what I've written already. And whether I can uh, imagine and make up another story, I don't know if it ever comes to me. I will. I will write. But until then, I'm not going to. Well, you wrote an opera, right? Could you tell the story of that? That is a that's a very yes. interesting uh, yes, story. That was something which uh, it was on the life and work of Mother Teresa. Before you start to think that it's a religious work, it's not at all. Uh, it's almost as irreverent as the Jesus Christ superstar was towards Jesus. Just Jesus' story as a man. And, uh, and this is just her story, her life and her work. And uh, many years ago I went to Calcutta and I happened to meet her. I happened, no, I went to meet her. And as she held, you know, she's got this habit of, had this habit of holding your hand in both of hers like this. And she did that to me, I, electricity, whatever, passed passed through all of me. And I suddenly had that idea on the spot. Uh, I said, Mother, I would like to, to compose a song about you. And I want to put it on my next album. And, and the royalties from that song, I would like to, I would like to contribute as my small little uh, a contribution for your work. She said, uh, beautiful, my son, do it. But do it with love for Jesus. And I told myself, I'm not capable of feeling love for any one religion or religious aid, because to me, God is, is beyond religion. But let's not talk about that. Uh, I said I'll do it with love for Mother Teresa, and for Mother Teresa's love for Jesus. And uh, anyway, so, so on the flight back from Calcutta to Bombay, it was one had to stop in Bombay at that time, there were no direct flights to go up. In those two and a half hours, I had never ever composed more than one song in a day, and that was not every day. I wrote four songs about Mother Teresa. I didn't know why. I don't want to attribute any any supernatural reason for that, but I wrote four songs. I came back and I started recording them. 
<coughs> but I could not find the right singers at least not in Goa at that time uh, because one song was supposed to be sung by by Mother Teresa herself one by the, the Mother Superior in Calcutta <coughs> one by the Pope in Rome and, uh, and the fourth one was an instrumental um, so I kept it aside and I told myself I'll ask my friends who are, who, who are into theater in Bombay to sing this to record these songs for me one day. And those were the very, very busy years in my, in my career. So before I knew it, 29 years or 27 years went by. And I never and I never went back to that work. Although it was always there in the back of my mind. In the meanwhile, Mother Teresa died and went away. Then I was in Porto, in Portugal, I had already moved to Portugal. When I suddenly had yet another attack of a, of a very bad back pain. And I was in bed for a month. And then I had these visions of horrible uh, nightmares of being an invalid one day. And how could I record songs? I'd have to devise a way to put everything in such a way that I can lie down and record, you know, attach uh, my keyboard and my speakers and everything horizontally, instead of vertically. And, uh, and that, and I took a, I made a vow at that time that as soon as I get off this bed, I'm going to, I'm going to finish this uh, project which I started 27 years ago, Mother Teresa's songs. This four or six, maybe I'll, I'll make it six songs now. And, uh, and this time I will not stop until I complete, complete all the songs. And I may also made a vow that another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to restart work on this book, which I'd started six or nine years earlier, which also I'd, I'd kept aside of the three chapters for the last nine, or nine years. And, and sure enough, as soon as I got out of bed, I started recording those, those four songs of Mother Teresa. When I finished the first song, the first song is her song when she decides to become a nun. And the second song is mother is a mother superior welcoming her in Calcutta, into Calcutta. And instead of recording the, the third song, which was the Pope's song, which took place much, much later, on the day that I completed the second song, an idea came for a third song, for a new third song. The day I completed the third song, when I was taking my morning shower, I had a fourth song ready and in my mind. And I went and recorded that. By the time I finished the fourth, the fifth, it, it just went on, went on and on and on. I could not stop it. I had never recorded one song a day or one song after the other like that. I had never composed <coughs> one song after the other in my life. And without stop, in one year, I had 48 songs. 48 songs and it, it become a, and it became an opera. And I call it an opera and not a musical because technically an opera does not have any spoken words, any spoken lines. It's all sung. This one is all sung. Uh, there were 35 singers in it. There were, uh, there were different characters in it, much more than just the folk and the mother superior. And uh, I never knew that I could you know, compose an opera. And the magical, the final magical thing, I, I like to call it magic, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, the final magical thing that happened when I completed the opera is, God, how long is an opera supposed to be? I didn't even know that. I loved Jesus Christ Superstar, the opera. I loved uh, The Greatest Showman on Earth. I loved uh, The Sound of Music. I loved so many musicals, so many. But I never timed them. I had no idea how long the musical was supposed to be. And with trepidation, I went and I checked. And they were all two hours long, more or less two hours long. And with even greater trepidation, I went and checked the length of my, of my opera. It was one hour and 57 minutes long. <laughs> there were three minutes remaining. And I had not written a, an overture. So those three minutes, I composed an overture and I recorded that. And the same kind of magic happened when I was writing this book. I told you I had, I had no experience with writing the book. And one thing after the other just fell in place, and the chapters and stuff like that. And, uh, 
yeah. So besides buying this book, also buy the Mother Trees album. <laughs> but that music, because that money is not going to Harper Collins and much less to me. I'm not even deduce, uh, de you know, deducting money for my expenditure in, in recording that opera. It is all going to the poorest of the poor in this world. And that is my small little contribution towards uh, the people in our society, our, our own, uh, you know, co-citizens of this country and of this world, who are less privileged than us, that's all. And uh, it's called Teresa and the Slum Bum. The Slum, I told you, it was irreverent. The Slum Bum is this character that I've invented, who is a character in the slum, who who sees her coming into the slum for the first time. He, he's a dada in the slum. You know, he's a really, he's a one of the Mithun Chakrabarti, with dirty white pants and a yellow shirt, just with slightly torn, and a, a, a sweaty red scarf. He's always dressed that way. Hair greased with motorcycle oil, probably. <laughs> and uh, he's a wannabe a Bollywood hero. Says, hey, what are you, what's a pretty white girl like you doing in a slum like this? And that's the way he welcomes her to the slum. Not welcomes her. He's sure that he's, she's just going to come like all the other so called, you know, high society benefactors. He's going to hand over some money and run away from the slum as soon as she can. He thinks that that's what she's going to do. But when he sees that she's not going nowhere and she's there, She's there, and she's there day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. He becomes her greatest supporter and, and fan. And uh, yeah, that's how the opera develops. So buy the opera, please. It's available online on every. Uh, no, this time I'm not asking you to buy it out of out of any any personal or personal uh, motives. It'll help to it'll help your fellow citizens, but besides that, believe me, it is beautiful music. If you, you feel like opera, I think. Well, when I say beautiful music, it's the best music I've done in my life. That much I can say. I won't say it's beautiful music. That's up to you to judge. It's the it's the best piece of music that I've created. Okay. I just uh, want to ask you one second. Last question. In Mexican uh, Spanish and even Sixteenth, they call a song called Cantar. And I felt a lot of similarity between Goan music and uh, their music. What is your opinion on Mexican songs, especially Paolo's songs? Yes, there's a lot of similarity. Mexican rhythms and uh, South American, you know, the rhythms especially. All of them have, have a six, six, eight beat that I'm talking about in Goan music. A rock and roll is a straight four four. Whereas Goan music has what? Not only Goan, Indian music has a lot, Indian folk music has a lot of this beat. South American music has it, and the Caribbean music has it. You know this, uh, the six eight rhythm. So you're right, and the music and, and the melodies in South America are, are also very simple and catchy, very folksy, you know, just like the Goan music. And cantar is a Portuguese word, which means to sing. It, it is, it's, it's an infinite form of the word to sing, of the verb to sing, cantar. Eu canto, tu cantas, ele canta. Nós cantamos, nós cantais, eles cantam. So cantar is the verb, to sing. And uh, then in Cochrane, we also call it a cantar mundre, we sing a song, so cantar will be adapted to mean a song, not just the word, the verb to sing, but to mean the noun, a song. Uh, and yes, that's what cantar comes from. And uh, you've been such a lovely audience, and you've been so patient in, in, in listening to this uh, singer talk and talk and talk and yap and yap and yap as a, as a personal. I think I'd like to sing you a couple of songs if you don't mind. Yeah. I mean, somebody was going yes, there. Is. We did. Rebo, Rebo, the professor of Mustansir Daldi would like to, before you sing, ask you yes, something. Sir. I wanted to ask you to sing the song. 
I beat you to it. Yeah. I think there's another gentleman here with a beard. Smart club, smart. Sir, I have seen uh, very few musicians like you, especially in India, who write their own lyrics, who compose their song, who make their own arrangement, who record their song. So, uh, a person, musician like you, when you worked uh, with uh, legendary Bollywood uh, the composers like Mr. Rehman or Mr. Jatin Lalit, both of them, uh, they were one of the biggest uh, of 90s in their own way. So, Jatin Lalit comes from a traditional kind of uh, uh, music like Lakshmi Kam Parila Lehaan. So, uh, how was your experience working with uh, those two composers, being yourself, uh, so was that freedom, was that given to you, and how you, uh, your, was your experience basically? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm this very humble guy who will not tell you that besides the whole list of things you, you just named about what I do in, in music, that I compose and various things. I won't, I won't tell you that I also uh, write a script for my music videos. I won't tell you that I also shoot them, that I also edit them. No, because I'm very, very humble. Uh, that I design my own album covers. I won't tell you any of that. But uh, the experience working with Rehman and with Rajatin Lalit, uh, Rajatin Lalit have done some songs which are copies of Western songs. Luckily, Pyar Torna Itha wasn't one of those. Although they used, they actually lifted the guitar introduction of, uh, uh, what's that song? When you really love a woman. Yeah, when you really love a woman. Uh, and they put it right in the beginning. It wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary. I don't know why they did that little piece of plagiarism, plagiarism because it wasn't necessary. The song is so beautiful in itself. Uh, it was a pleasure singing it. And uh, no, they don't uh, really insist on me, on on telling me what to do. On the contrary, whenever I've been asked to sing a, a film song, I've been always told to try and sing it in my way. So when I said, to ho na ita, nobody corrected me. <laughs> nobody corrected me. And months later, when the song came out and everybody said, you said ta instead of tha, I asked Jatin Adit, man, why didn't you correct me? Even the lyric writer was there, why didn't you correct me? No, because it was cute. <laughs> And now they started to sing Pyar to Hona Itha. You know, people don't want me to do it. <laughs> they expect me to sing Pyar to Hona Itha. And why did it come out Ta? Because in Goan, Catholic, Konkani, the sounds Th, Th, Th don't really exist. We say Th, Th, B. In, in Goan, Hindu, Konkani, yes, all those Indian sounds exist. So that's why I sang it that way. And working with Rehman, Rehman of course never lives a song or part of a song. I've been always a great fan of Rehman. So meeting him backstage after a show, at a show in Delhi where he and I both performed was was a fantastic experience. And he asked me, Remo, would you, would you sing a song in, uh, in Telugu? I said, what? I have enough problems singing in Hindi, man. <laughs> But I tried. I said, I didn't know what I was getting you know, myself in for. And one week later, he called me and he said, there's a song called Hama Hama, will you sing it? And I went to Chennai and if I thought that I had problems pronouncing Hindi, in Telugu, I could not even hear the different nuances that they wanted me to, to pronounce. Very tough, very tough. But I believe the Telugu version also became a huge hit. I'm sure because of my mispronunciations. <laughs> <laughs> but so is the Hindi version. And it was a pleasure working for it. It was a pleasure working for most of the, of the Hindi film industry, music directors. Because as you know, I write my own songs. So once in a way, I'm singing somebody else's song and trying to put my own. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a different feeling. For composing a song, I've also composed songs for other singers studying their style and, uh, and composing a song for their style. One of the most notable one was Hema Sarkasai, who is a famous singer from Goa. And uh, I had represented India at, at a festival in East Germany at that time. And I won three awards at that festival. And they asked me to, to name a singer for the next year. And the first 
names that came to me were these national names. And Hema was known only in Goa, and she was not known outside Goa at all. And suddenly I, I thought, why not Hema? She's as good as all these national singers, and she needs it more than any other one. And, every, and one of the conditions was everybody had to sing an original song. So I composed a song for her to sing according to her style, and she won the Grand Prix. She, she won she won the prize uh, in East Germany next year. So just to tell you that I enjoy doing all these different things in music. There are so many things you can do besides just taking the, the guitar and sing. You can compose in composing itself, you can compose for yourself, you can compose for a film, or you can compose for another singer and for that singer's style. All these things are different and there are so many, like in every profession, there are different nuances that a layman cannot see, but only somebody who is in the profession knows the different nuances in each profession. Each profession has a universe in itself. It's beautiful. And um, I think it's going way above Limka time. <laughs> Limka time was a code word of my parents' generation for drink time. In Goa. <laughs> <laughs> they would drink anything but Limka. <laughs> I'll take my guitar and sing a couple of songs for you, okay? Because, uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Buy the book. It's invaluable, and enjoy the enjoy the music.
heavy rotters. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very big thank you to Vivek Vinayas, Mouse Abad, 
all the organizers of this festival for inviting me here. And a special thank you and salam to all the fantastic authors who are here for me tonight. To you, sir, and to everybody else. Thank you. Lovely. And thank you for accepting me on this.